Hi, this is Mark. I'm here with Dick Brenner. This is chapter two in uh, Dick Brenner's stories. And what we're going to talk about today is uh, the recovery of a P-51A model, which is quite rare. Hello, Dick. How are you? Yeah, good morning. I'm doing well. Uh, the P-51A, I found it kind of by accident. Uh, I was flying my tailor craft down from Fairbanks and I landed in Cantwell to, to get something to eat and gas up. I had a 1946 tailor craft and I was just kind of cruising the country looking for, for downed warbirds and, and anything else interesting to keep me out in the woods with my airplane because that's where I like to be. That's, uh, that's uh, my passion is going out and prospecting for air air place, uh, places to land my airplane and, and get away from all of it. And uh, of course, my, my one of my real loves is warbirds, and I've had a few T6s since this P51 recovery, and uh, fun airplane to fly. And and I've since gotten a ride in several Mustangs. And if you're a flyer, if you're a pilot, uh, if and you have it, any kind of chance or ability to get a ride in a P51 or a similar warbird, do it because it's it's a real it's a fun thing for pilots. It's really fun. everybody I've talked to that has flown a P fifty one said that is the epitome of their aviation career. It I've is. It talked is. Talked to Navy test pilots that have flown everything, all the new stuff, and I said, "What's your favorite airplane to fly?" P fifty one that they do in test pilot school. <laughs> I can. Every one of them I can says see that. that. Yeah. So now, what's the difference, like the P fifty one A versus all the other models? Well, the A was one of the the early uh, designs and it was manufactured with an Allison engine. It's what the U.S. had to supply as far as a high-performance engine back at that time in a water-cooled variant. The British had a Rolls-Royce Merlin and it was similar. It was 12, inline 12, V12, and water-cooled, so they, they shared some similarities. Uh, but the Merlin engine had uh, better capabilities. It, it had, uh, I believe, injection. Uh, help me out with that. I'm not really sure, but it, it was a higher performance engine. Right. I think the that, Merlin, uh, yes, fuel injection. Yeah. You know, it was turbocharged. Or did it have a higher pressure turbocharger? Yeah. It was just, it, it, better performance. The Allison uh, that was in this P51A, I believe, had a 1,200 horse engine, and the, the Merlin is like 1,450 somewhere in that area. Uh, so it was a, a higher performance setup. But we had the, the Allison available to us and that's what we used at the time. And the A model had the Allison on it. And a uh, Curtis Electric three-bladed propeller. Now uh, I stopped in Cantwell with the airplane to get gas and I walked across the tracks and there's a little restaurant there and I stopped in, I ordered a hamburger. And I'm sitting at one of the tables and it's during moose hunting season, and I overheard two moose hunters sitting behind me talking about stumbling across a single-seat airplane that had a V-12 engine on it, and my old ears perked right up. I go, and so I got up and I walked over to him and I says, "Could you tell me a little more about this airplane that you just found?" And they did. They described it, and it was fairly intact, and uh, they didn't know if it could be fixed up, but they said it was a real surprise to come across that in the woods like they did. And I asked him if, if I went out in the airplane and got my sectional map, if they put a dot on the map where it's at, I'd like to go look at it too. And so I went out in the T-Craft and I brought my uh, map back in, laid it out in front of them and pointed out where we were located. And, and they put a circle on the map and they said, it's right in this circle right here. And it circle wasn't all that small. It was kind of just a big loosely wrote uh, about the size of a coffee can. You know, it wasn't that bad, but it was a, uh, I got the gist. But they I, narrow, I, narrowed it down if from there's the entire an air, state. If there's was... an airplane in that area, I'm going to find it, right? So as soon as I ate, I went and uh, got in the airplane and I flew right. It was only a few minutes away, uh, less than 15 minutes from Cantwell. And uh, I flew down there and I circled and I saw pop cans. I saw every tiny little thing, but I didn't see no airplane. And so it was, that was getting towards the fall of the year. And excuse me. Then I went on home and I, 
I, I, all winter long that bugged me. And so next spring I went back up there and of course it's up high up there in Broad Pass and the snow was still thick. And so I had to come back in June, late June, and the snow was all gone and I just, I could not find it. But uh, I eventually uh, went up behind Pyramid Mountain and came down a gorge that I hadn't looked at and uh, it, the airplane was located there. It was uh, down in the bottom of the gorge. It struck the mountain up higher, and over the years, the, the snow melts had uh, caused it to slide down into the bottom of the gorge. And uh, now, that's. Do you think the pilot crashed there? Was this like the Len Lease? Was this aircraft destined for uh, Soviet Union? Or? Well, maybe variants of it or uh, models of it, but this particular airplane was one of two that was sent to Alaska in 1943 for cold weather testing, as I found out later. And I got the crash record from the uh, Air Force. And uh, what happened was there, there was two aircraft that left Ladd Field in the wintertime, headed for Elmendorf in Anchorage, and they got to uh, right over Cantwell, and it was about to enter Broad Pass, which is a pretty wide, long pass. It takes you down almost to Talkeetna from up there, about 80 miles. And they ran into a snowstorm. I mean, it was just blocked solid with snow, heavy snow. And it does, it, it snows a lot up there in that area. Um, and the P-51 made a 180 degree right-hand turn and flew right into Pyramid Mountain, and it killed the pilot, Lieutenant Geeter, and they recovered his body about three days later. And there was a P-39 accompanying him, and that pilot, uh, and they were following the Alaska Burr Road from Fairbanks down to Anchorage. It goes right through there. And he just pulled his throttle back and landed in the deep snow alongside the railroad tracks. Really didn't hurt the airplane much at all. Uh, and the airplane sat there for uh, several years, and finally, the military went up there, and, and because it had been reported as a downed airplane, they were getting tired of that happening. They, they got a program going, uh, and they hired Joe Reddington Sr., the Iditarod mush, musher fella, mm -hmm. and uh, he went around and blew up a bunch of these with dynamite. I don't know if he destroyed the P-39 there along the tracks uh, just south of Cantwell. But it's pretty much all gone. There used to be, within sight of the highway there, there used to be pieces of it between the tracks and the highway. And the, the engine might still be there. But that was uh, the second half of that flight. And that fellow caught a north, the pilot of the P-39 caught a northbound freight and uh, within an hour and was having coffee in Cantwell just shortly thereafter, unhurt. But the, the P-51 was missing. Uh, and a, and a search three days later found found the airplane and his body still in the cockpit. And so there it sat. And then I came along and I thought, hmm, that's pretty cool. So I, I, I walked in there and looked at it. And when I when I got in there and looked at it, it looked it was much rougher than it looked from the air. So you spotted it with your airplane. Spotted you it. You went back, landed at Cantwell. Yeah, no, I, no, I didn't land at Cantwell. There's an airstrip within three and a half miles of the crash site uh, that, that was built in World War II. I don't know if that strip was there. It's called Summit. It's about a 4,000 foot by 200 foot wide gravel runway, and they built them all over the state to facilitate cross country flights by the military. And that's about halfway between Fairbanks and Anchorage, uh, along a, a very popular. Uh, route to fly because the Alaska Railroad uh, was right there and it, the best way to go through those tall mountains was right that same route. So they, a lot of traffic, military traffic, went back and forth uh, during those days over that route. And uh, so I, I, I didn't even bother taking any pictures of it. I just thought it was pretty rough. And I came back out and then some time went by, maybe a year or two, and I was, I was down uh, looking at a J3 Cub that was for sale in Versailles, Ohio. And uh, the fella that ran the uh, FBO there, his name was Walden Spillers, Moon Spillers for short, uh, asked me if, uh, when, when I was looking at the J3 there at his field, if, if I knew of any crashed World War II type airplanes in Alaska. And I said, I started 
naming them P38s, P40s, P, P51A. And when I said P51A, he stopped me. And he says, my goodness, you, you know where there's a P51A, an Allison? I says, yeah, it's got an Allison engine still on it. And I said, he, he asked me where it was at. And I told him approximately where it was at. It was up near Cantwell, which is about halfway to Fairbanks from Anchorage. And uh, he said, would there, when you get back, would there be any chance of getting some pictures of it? And I said, yeah, it's, it's a little bit of a walk in there. It's three and a half miles as a crow flies, but it's about twice that having to walk in there. The first time I walked to the airplane, I took a, from the strip, I took a straight line. And that wasn't the way to do it because there's some deep swamps. And I went right across all of them. And then there's a river you got to cross. And I just bored right through that, too. And uh, uh, I was one tired puppy by the time I got up there. And I found out later from flying the area that there was there was uh, trails and, and uh, there was a couple little roads that took me up pretty close to the, at least to the river. And uh, I was able to get in a little easier later on. And I made about uh, between 15 and 20 trips by walking in and out of there to this site before the airplane was recovered. It was a two year recovery. It was a involved recovery. So the first thing is you go in and take pictures. I went, okay, so I, I came back and I flew up and a friend and I, uh, we walked in there and we took some pictures and I brought them back out and I had them developed and I put them in an envelope. And three days later, I got a knock at the door at my residence in Anchorage and there's two fellows at the door. One of them was Moon Spillers and the other one was at Charlie Drap from Pickway, Ohio and a uh, friend of his. And they, they wanted to go up and put their own eyes on it. So I took them up there and we walked in. And it was like two kids in a candy store. I started jumping up and down. I thought, whoa, <laughs> that's, it's, it's cool to see people that excited, you know. Right, right. And uh, he says, well, I want to recover it. I want to recover it. This is, I think I can make this fly again. Okay. So I, I kind of gave him an idea of what he needed to do as far as uh, permits and letters and and Moon went back and spent the next year getting all the authorizations in line to do this. Do you need this from the Air Force, or because this was he, an Army Air Corps? He got a aircraft. letter. He got a letter from the Air Force. The letter from the Air Force was uh, uh, non-committal on their part. They said anything that crashed in Alaska after or before 1953, they they didn't even want to hear about. It, it was long off their inventory, and uh, unless there was uh, uh, MIA missing in action. Um, body or body parts in the airplane. They didn't want to hear about it. So that was uh, that was good. And then he, then he got stuff from North American Aviation. And he got stuff from the state of Alaska. He, he did its homework, you know. And in 19, uh, let's see, when was this? This was in 1975, 76 is when he started on that. The, the permit process was a lot easier than it is now. So, so just to make sure I, I have this straight, so you need, um, the, the Air Force would have an interest in the aircraft, North American maybe, the manufacturer, and the state of Alaska. Anybody else, FAA, federal oh. government, other than the Air Force? Uh, yeah, there's, there's, there's quite a bit of homework that you need to do. And uh, uh, it's still possible to recover airplanes up here. Okay. But there's there's a there's a lot of paperwork involved, and uh, the, I'm involved with the museum in Anchorage, and we've done a, a lot of recoveries, and there's land use permits, there's there's all kinds of, of uh, uh, requirements you, you need to pursue before you can recover an airplane up here. Ownership is a is the primary. And then uh, care of the land. They're very interested in that no damage occurs to the land out there. Mm -hmm. And so we almost entirely use a uh, helicopter in our recoveries now. Okay. Yeah. All right. So then you go up the first time, take pictures. Then you, you bring uh, Moon Spillers and the other fella. Mm -hmm. Charlie Drap. Charlie Drap. And they're like kids in a candy yep. store. Yep. Like so where do you go from here? Well, they... Uh, <laughs> They had not a clue of how to recover it, and I says, "Well, the the easiest way would be a helicopter, and that means you'd 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 have to dismantle it. And it was in a real precarious spot. It was right alongside of a cliff, 
that was about 1500 foot vertical and it was uh, and it was narrow narrow through there it was not, not a lot of fun flying through that canyon because <laughs> there's corners you got to go around corners and uh, but that, I'll, get, I'll get into that here in a few minutes but so they went back and they got their uh, or, or moon went back and he got his uh, all his paperwork lined up and he called me up and he says hey I'm good to go and I've uh, I've talked to a, a helicopter outfit based in Anchorage, and they've got equipment coming down in uh, the first part of October from the slope, and they're going to do their winter maintenance in Anchorage on this equipment. And they had arranged for a, uh, a 205 Huey to stop there at Summit Airstrip, and we were to help them unload all their gear, and they were going to go in there and, and lift the parts out and bring them out to the strip. And I thought, man, this is, that, it's just great. Fantastic. Fantastic. So I borrowed my dad's motor home and, and it, I had a trailer and we pulled the trailer with a bunch of gear on it and so forth. And we went up to the Summit Airstrip and waited on the helicopter. Helicopter showed up on time and uh, we unloaded all the, he had drums of fuel in there and, and lifting gear and we unloaded all that. And we all hopped in it and we went up to do a, uh, survey site. He wanted to look at the airplane and, and kind of get a, a feel for the surrounding terrain. And so he flew in there and he came in real slow up the canyon and he's, you could just see the airplane in front of us. Uh, it was about 75 feet from that vertical cliff. And uh, as we got closer to it, the helicopter stopped and he just hovered there and we were wrapped with, con uh, with rock all over. It was real bizarre feeling being there in a helicopter and <laughs> this guy was a very good pilot and uh, it was reassuring his his experience he was uh, had flown him in Vietnam recently so and I would think it would have to be very good weather yeah it was little good. wind it was there was no wind at all that was perfect and uh, he, he crept he got getting a little bit closer to it and then he stopped and then he just went vertical. He just went straight up. The, the helicopter rose about 2,000 feet, and then he kind of turned, and he came in, and he did it. He did that three times, and he said, guys, I'm sorry, but that, that airplane's just sitting too close to that, that cliff in order to lift it safely with the helicopter. And, oh, man, we were just, we were down in the dumps. <laughs> we went back and helped him load all his gear back in the helicopter, and off he went. And Moon turned to me, and he says, Dick, what do we do now? And I says, well, we're, we're going to have to, we're going to have to get a track vehicle and go in there and work our way up there and pull it out with a track vehicle of some kind. And uh, he says, well, where do we get one of those? And I said, well, either Fairbanks or Anchorage. So we were, I think we were a little closer to Fairbanks. So we decided to head north. And so we, we get in my pickup truck. I had my pickup truck there also. And up we go, and we're climbing this hill, this long hill, and up in, on the side of the road, uh, northbound, is a, it looked like a World War II six by six pulling a trailer with a World War II weasel on it, and there was steam coming out of the, the engine on this six by six. Now, what is, what is a weasel? It's a track vehicle, and they go everywhere up here. I mean, they just, they work pretty good, you know. Uh, so... We pull around in front of this guy and we get the three of us get out and we we walk we walk back down and he's giving us kind of the evil eye like he's right. out in the middle of nowhere with a broken down he's truck. Like, what do you guys want? Yeah. And he's got his family in the truck and they've been out in the out in the woods all summer long cruising around the country uh, just for something to do. And uh, and so I, I started talking to him and I introduced myself and introduced uh, Moon and uh, Moon had a picture of the P-51A and I said we were I told him the story as quickly as I could up to that point what had happened and he's you could tell that he just wanted to get home to Fairbanks and then Moon pulled a picture of the P-51 out as they're rolling it out of North American sent him a picture of the airplane the day they rolled it out you know in the factory mm -hmm. and this guy says that's what's out there in the woods and Moon said yeah that's what we're trying to get and he says tell you what let me take my we'll fix the truck here and I'll go to Fairbanks and I'll take my family home and I'll turn around and come back down and we'll go out there and do it, you know, and uh, recover that for you. 
And I, oh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. So we went back down to Summit, and the next evening, he pulls in, he comes back in, and then the next morning, we take off and we go up there, and we get past uh, the river part of the trip, and uh, the road stops at one bank and begins again at the other bank, and we go up there, and we get about halfway through the first big swamp on the on the other side of the river, and the transfer case went clang, 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 it broke. Oh, no. And the transfer case on those things, you know, we got a long ways to go back to the highway. I don't know, it weighs 100 pounds, 150 pounds maybe. It was, it was big and heavy. And uh, so we all walked back out to the highway, and he gets, he gets in his truck, and he goes, I'll be back tomorrow. And he shows up the next day, and he's, he went up and purchased a snowcat, which is a Volkswagen-powered track vehicle. And right. he also had a spare transfer case, so we loaded that in the snowcat, and we, we went back and fixed his uh, weasel. And so the two vehicles went up, made it up to the P-51 crash, uh, site and we recovered the uh, fuselage that that evening and I made a travoy for the one wing and the wings were had rocks and gravel in them from the years of being in a glaciated environment mm -hmm. you know the you know the creek bed and the water would come in down in the spring and fill it and it was heavy plus the landing gear was still folded up in the wing and believe it or not the the tire still held air pressure after all these years, that was... Uh, You're kidding. This is no, 40, this is, 50 years later. No, this is, I think, 30 years after 30 the crash. 43 to 75. 75, okay. Yeah, about approximately 30 years. Mm -hmm. And the tires were so strange. It was, they were, they put, had put this airplane on skis, and it was when it crashed, it had experimental tires. Uh, for uh, Instead of studs, it had little springs that were about a half inch long, embedded in the rubber so it had a kind of a gripping action on the ice sticking the springs are sticking straight out no no no. they were laying, kind of long. they were laying sideways sideways okay flat yeah mm -hmm. no not yeah and uh anyway that, that so the, the the wings were fairly heavy and so we we brought the one wing out and we brought the fuselage out that night and i'd already packed i packed the engine mount out on my back uh uh, on another on another trip and I'm kind of getting ahead of myself because part of the recovery was dropping uh, uh, tools I boxed up a, tools and lifting gear for the helicopter before we went in there and started dismantling the airplane so that it, it wouldn't have to pack it in because we were packing in up to that point we've been packing in so I I had come home and I sold it and sold uh, my J3 Cub and my T-Craft and a set of floats I had, and I bought a T6 for $11,000 down in Canada, and I oh brought that one. Yeah, my first T6. And so that's what I had to fly. So I took and loaded up uh, Moon in the back seat of this T6, and and uh, we uh, flew up to Broad Pass and up to the airplane crash site. And my idea was to, if I put set this box of tools and stuff in his lap and I wrapped it up with tape really good and put some uh, uh, surveyors tape on it so we could find it once it hit the ground in the brush and I flew up around Pyramid Mountain and then you got to drop your gear and your flaps to create all the drag you can and then and then it was kind of like a Star Wars trip going down through that canyon making these it was really spooky and Moon was terrified he was totally terrified because these vertical rocks are right on our wingtips. They're right there. And your T6, just in case people don't know, the T6 is a World War II trainer yeah. that the uh, pilots trained in before they would have moved on to a P-51 or other yeah. aircraft. Yeah, that's really a good airplane. And uh, so I had him open his canopy as we're coming down through there, and, and he was... He was really terrified. I didn't realize how terrified he was. And, and uh, so anyway, I get just where I want him to drop it out. And I says, okay, shove it out now, Moon, over the intercom system. And I gave it the power to climb out of this canyon. And uh, I turn around, I look back, and he's just getting it up on the side of the canopy. And now we're, we're almost a quarter mile away oh, from no. it. Yeah, and I, I said, no, 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 Moon, hold on to it. So we went up and we went around again, and we came back down. <clears throat> 
and did the same thing. And this time he was a little closer, but he still hadn't pushed it out. And I says, okay, what I want you to do this time is just leave it sitting on the canopy rail, hold on to it, and, uh, and then I'm going to climb up. We're going to do it again, a third time, and come down. And down through the canyon we come. And I, when I yelled now, I, I, it was about 250 feet in front of us. I figured it'd be pretty close. I hope it didn't hit the airplane. But I says, okay, go ahead and push it out. He shoved it out, and it went down. It landed 50 feet away. It was perfect. All right. Yeah, it didn't, didn't lose any of the tools. or It all stayed intact. It was pretty neat. So anyway, that's... That's uh, not so we, easy to do. No, we went in. We dismantled the airplane and got it all ready to lift. And then the helicopter thing came along, and that went away. And so now we're, we're stuck with pulling it out by hand, you know, right. with the weasel and the snowcat, which we did. And, and were you able to get eventually the whole airplane on the The airplane's okay. flying now. It's been okay. flying. So you got all the, well, I'm going to get to that. That's That part's very interesting. Mm -hmm. But you got all the parts you didn't have to, you said you carried an engine mount on your back. Yeah. That, the, but did yeah, you get most I, of the stuff out on the weasel? And yeah. The yeah. I, we didn't have access to anything, but we had the engine mount sitting there. And when the helicopter pilots had said no, I was, I was going to pack the airplane out on my back if I had to. Sure. And so uh, I, I packed that one part out um, before we had access to a weasel. But it's, uh, that, and that, was a big, that was a big item to ha pack out there. <laughs> so how many trips did it take with these two vehicles back and forth? It took two trips is all. For the whole airplane? Yeah. Wow. No, we did, I didn't bring the engine out or the propeller. That, that, that's still there. Okay. I never did recover that. So Moon said he had access to an engine and a prop. So we just left that there. And it was that, that would have been a big job to pull that out. Sure. So you got so. all the parts down to Cantwell? Well, to Summit so Airstrip. Some, I'm sorry, Summit yeah. Airstrip. And we right. loaded them on our trailer. Mm -hmm. But not quite all the parts yet. Because we had a wing that uh, was left up there. And so the next day we took the uh, weasel back up there. <clears throat> and just the weasel. And we brought the, I hooked onto the wing and we were dragging it behind us on a, on two logs that I'd built up and bolted together, kind of keep the wing off the ground. And uh, we get almost back to the airstrip and just below the airstrip there at Summit is a long swamp. It's about a half mile long and it's about 100 yards wide, maybe 150 yards wide. And uh, we get right across this swamp. The swamp's three foot deep in water, but it, uh, it's got ice that's already built up and it's snowing real hard. The snow had started. It, it, this was like the 15th of October and it was already winter time up there. It was miserable. Uh, and it got dark and we're, we're crossing that last swampy wa water infested swamp and uh, one of the tracks broke on the weasel. In the swamp? In the middle of the swamp in three foot of water. So Larry and I, the, the own, Larry owned the, uh, the weasel. He had a section of track, and we had to change that section of track in the water. And in this that, is the fellow from Fairbanks, so he's yeah, full in on this recovery. Yeah, he's excited yeah. as well as everybody else. Moon and Charlie, they went up to the motorhome and started up the motorhome and, and stayed nice and warm in there, but we were both purple. It was, a, it was a miserable. It took us about an hour, maybe an hour and a half to... To change that section of track and anyway we got the you know, like uh, Larry said if he doesn't get it if we don't get it out it's going to freeze in and the wing and that weasel will be there all winter long and that that's not a good thing no. I didn't want that to happen so we just we just you know doubled down and got after it so we got it up there and then we took the, uh, the the airplane back to Anchorage took it over to my dad's construction yard and I built a big crate for it and I shipped it down to um, St. Paul, Minnesota on a truck. And Moon went up there and got it. And him and his son, David, spent 10 years restoring it. And it's now flying. And it's owned by a gentleman in Can uh, uh, western Kansas right now. Fantastic. And, uh, yep. Now, when it came out and you had it on the trailer, at that before anything was started on the restoration, were, were, were the wings bent up? crashed or were they, were they in decent shape? Did they actually were able to work with them? 
you, you know, I don't know. I, I don't think they use those wings. I think he ended up getting another set of uh, Mustang wings, and, which made the project a lot easier. And I think they were D, D wings modified back to an A configuration because the, the leading edge uh, is a little different uh, next to the fuselage. I'm not that schooled on, on Mustangs, but uh, it took him 10 years. And Moon called me in 1987 and he says, uh, Dick, I'm going to have this airplane at Oshkosh. He says, you got to come down and see it. And so I uh, hopped in my pickup and I drove to Oshkosh and I got two rides in it down there. All right. Yeah. So you actually got to ride in this plane. Yeah. Could you ever have imagined that when you were flying around? looking for it when you first no, no I, didn't, I never when i looked at it i says <laughs> you know i didn't yeah you know maybe this guy's really really good but i never thought that i'd get a chance to ride in it and uh it was it was it was fun that's and, uh, really fantastic. allison powered ride is uh in a mustang is a rare thing most of them have got the uh, packard built by general motors under license from uh, rolls royce they're powered with those and so and I've got rides in those too. And, and I, hey, anytime you can get a ride in a Mustang, take it. <laughs> what an airplane! Oh God, yeah, they just sound sublime. Yeah, yeah. They're fantastic. Yeah, it is. And so, so the airplane's in Kansas now. It's in Kansas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Liz, it's got a. Uh, it's resides in a really good home. I've been down there, seen it. It took an awful lot of dedication. There were a lot of points. The first time, you go up there. Oh, I don't see anything. Mm -hmm. You come back the next year, mm -hmm. and you finally do see it. You could have said, "Oh, it's an awful hard hike up yeah. there." With the first time you beelined it, you I actually just... went. I went back. I, I got the contact number for these hunters, one of them, and I actually made a, a second trip to visit him. Uh, just, and I told him I couldn't find it, and, and uh, he says, "Well, it's there." Uh, I didn't take any pictures, but he says, "I'm not." Uh, we actually saw it. It's really there. It's not just ain't a fabricated story because uh, I've been the recipient of a lot of fabricated stories and I've chased down a lot of airplanes that were just uh, They didn't exist, you know, people just like to talk airplanes and and they'll they'll tell a story, you know, and but this one this one was there Fantastic yeah. and then another I think decision point for uh, a group less dedicated when the helicopter came in, said, ah, this can't be done. Yeah. It would have been awful easy just to go, oh, oh well, that was a nice, nice thought. But no. No, if we do All it, you guys yeah. said, nope, okay, how do we get over this bridge? Yeah. How There's a go? lot more to this story. This is a kind of a, a really condensed version of the recovery. But there's a lot to this story that, that uh, you know, I, I haven't talked about that really should be included somewhere in a story where we really take our time and, mm -hmm. and give it the detail that it deserves. Because it's it's, but for this, at least this gets the the story out there. Yeah, yeah, um, sure does. Uh, it's it's exciting stuff. It's fun to do, and uh, I got hooked on recoveries. I just the challenge. I'm up for a challenge, and this was a real challenge. But uh, I've been involved with the Air Museum since its uh, beginnings, and I've been on all their recoveries, and uh, we've had some challenging times with some of the aircraft. Uh, our first recovery was a, a, a Canadian-built PBY, which was an amphibian, uh, and it was built in Canada. And the Canadians called it Canzo, and it was built for the U.S. Army, of all things. Came up here and flew for a short period of time in the 10th Air Rescue Squadron. This is a World War II-era Twin-engine amphibian airplane with a 104-foot wingspan. And we ended up uh, recovering that and helicoptering it from where it was located in Dago Lake on the Alaska Peninsula, 450 miles with an Army helicopter to Anchorage. And that was a multi-year project getting that recovered. And uh, that was the first museum recovery, and we've done a lot since then. And uh, I eat that stuff up. I love being out there. Oh, it's great stuff. And yeah. the PBY is quite storied. In history, yeah, it is. Yeah, it, it did flew a lot of the search, uh, search patterns in World War II. For big, the Navy. big time presence in World War II, a major presence up here in World War II. Well, in all uh, all over the Pacific, yeah, mm -hmm. and the Atlantic. Uh, they used them everywhere. Uh, in every theater, uh, PBYs were were seen and used. 
and that and aircraft saved a lot of our guys. That aircraft is still at the museum. It is. It's in Anchorage. It's unrestored. It's just like we found it. Um, I've been collecting parts for it for years. I've got another set of wings for it now. Um, I've got uh, just just about everything we need to put it together, except some of the raw materials like sheet metal and. I think uh, Boeing's going to help the museum out a little bit. Uh, at one time, they they thought they'd help us out with some of the sheet metal needs on it. And then Pratt & Whitney of Canada said they'd help us out with engines and so forth. That'd be another fantastic so, project. It's it, it's in the middle. It's recovered, uh, but has yet to fly. That's right. Yeah, so and I, I, I understand it's about out. a hundred thousand hour man hour project. So it's a it's a real uh, for our little group of volunteers. It's a it's kind of a mass undertaking, and that's why we haven't started it yet. Uh, See, 100,000 man hours, if, if I could tell our audience a little bit about Dick Benner, that would be like him and maybe a helper. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 that's, uh, that's not correct. <laughs> no, that, two helpers. <laughs> that, two helpers, there you go. That, that's a lot of work. Um, well, we'll continue this another time. But uh, I'd like to thank you very much for doing this. Oh, you're this welcome. Is, this is great getting yeah. getting these stories and uh, getting them recorded. Yeah, and I, I took pictures. So uh, sometime we can maybe drag drag out some photos, and I can show you some pictures. I'd love to see them. Cool. I'll try and get them from you. Thank All you right. very much. You're welcome. Copyright Mark Steinhilber, 2020.